So I'm going to rush the slides a little bit. Uh, don't worry if you don't catch all the text. I'll try and, uh, you know, I, you can always have a copy. Um, these are our collaborators. Uh, this was the original title of the talk, but in the last day or two, we've come up with a tentative name pending, you know, rubber stamping by lawyers or whatever. <laughs> uh, the UR was uh, basically preserving the, the previous working name, which was Unified Release, and it just kind of has some uh, implication of scientific discovery. Um, okay, so I mean, basically the problem we were dealing with, as you know, is uh, if, you, if you work in astronomy is that we've been using our old um, legacy system for the past 20 to 30 years called IRAF. Um, at least a lot of astronomers have. So people coming, there are people coming from IDL as well, but um, that has its own issues. Um, it, you know, neither of the programming languages is based on a very uh, modern and, um, you know, it's time to move on really and, and join the rest of the scientific community in using, using Python. Um, the previous system had very self-contained, but, um, you know, th that was its real remaining upside. But so, um, so that makes it a bit difficult to, you know, move to Python because there are 20 or 30 things that you suddenly have to install and that's really not a mean feat, even if you have a bit of experience. So we came up with this project, the Unified Release, that I've been talking to Perry about for the past several years. And in the past year or two, we've actually made quite a lot of progress towards releasing it. Um, it's a self-contained bundle of our software and its dependencies, including Python and IRAF, and various packages led on them. Um, and some of our goals, not in their original wording, are to be easy to install, particularly for users who are at least equipped to install things for themselves. Um, it's not supposed to be everybody's favorite installation method. You know, some people won't like having multiple Pythons on their computer. Other people aren't going to, uh, you know, be happy about uh, not having it integrated into their OS or whatever. But it does give everybody a way to get the stuff if they need to. It doesn't require root privileges. You don't have to wait six months for your admin to install it. Um, there's some limited support for add-ons or multiple versions of a, of a given package. Um, it doesn't interfere with other software in the system. That's pretty important for us if we're trying to support the users via our help desk. And uh, we need to have continuous integration as a kind of feasibility thing just because it's, you know, it's too complicated to collaborate on something like this without having that kind of constant feedback. Um, I'm going to gloss over this a bit. I don't even remember all of the reasoning that went into it originally, but, um, you know, of course there were lots of several Python distributions out there already that we could have um, considered using, like, say, GPD, Python XY, and SciSoft. None of them really met all our requirements. Um, of course, they don't come with IRAF, but, uh, and, you know, our existing tools. Um, some of them didn't support the OSs we wanted. Um, they weren't installable in the user's home directory, and there were, there were a couple of other requirements I think we had problems with. We also need the flexibility, really, to be able to modify the system and, and redistribute it to our users to say, here, use this version or whatever, or to, you know, um, to make changes. Um, building the distribution itself is not actually that difficult. I mean, starting from some level of experience compiling things, you can do it in a couple of weeks, but making something that's reliable and works on several platforms and so on is a much bigger task. Um, since we since we started, uh, Nthought did release EPD free, which certainly helps a lot of people, but um, still didn't quite meet all our requirements, but it, you know, that, that's um, is a solution that will work for a lot of people. We're not really trying to provide something like that as a competitor. We're trying to provide something that's specific to what our users need. Um, so we, we kind of came up with this compromise that was based on Sage, which was the closest thing to uh, what we needed. Um, and it sits alongside RF and um, has um, under extra packages that we've installed in a parallel directory. And then we configure the environment to find things, uh, you know, the right versions of things in the right places. And so I'm just going to demonstrate that very quickly. It was almost a good solution, but to one of the uh, stumbling points that wasn't too obvious was that the the way Sage has uses the web GUI for its notebook uh, has very different assumptions from from what we need for using Matplotlib and TKinter. 
and so they're bundling a load of their own versions of libraries where we have to link to the OS versions and that mess things up a bit. It's also four gigabytes, which is containing lots of mathematical stuff that we don't really strictly need. And the dependency chain looks something like that. It's pretty horrendous, really, and depending which platform you're on as well. So as things stand now, the Space Telescope's uh, actually doing some work this week to replace Sage, well, not just this week, but at the moment, uh, to replace Sage with um, our own build of some of the packages like Python. That's in progress. Uh, it incorporates some feedback from our internal testing of the Sage version. Um, it's likely to include the new RF216 as well, which has come out while we've been working on this. So we're aiming for a public beta release within a couple of months. Um, and basically the system's based on bash scripts. Um, well, SH scripts. Um, it has a static core with Python and IRF and some ability to add on optional packages and variants, as we call them. Um, when you I'll show you how it works in a minute, but basically you get a UR setup command and that configures your environment to, to run the, the programs that we're distributing. It doesn't need, a notable feature is it doesn't need LD library path or Python path settings, so that minimizes its conflict with other software. Um, we use a couple of programs to patch the binary run paths. Um, I'll expand on that in a sec. And we have a diagnostic script for logging information that's useful for troubleshooting and just doing some quick tests. So. Just quickly, we have a tar file basically um, here. Um, you can, if you want to install it, you can untar that on your machine. I'm, I'm just simulating that there because it actually takes nine minutes to unpack, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then we run this program called UR Normalize. So um, in the bin directory, what was that? Oh, you want to increase the font? Yeah, sorry. Does that help? I think that's, that's full screen. It should be all on there. Um, so <clears throat> once you've unpacked the table, you run this UR normalized script. And it's doing several different things. Um, it's editing the binary run paths. So you're, usually the dynamic linker in your um, machine will look in certain uh, specific places for libraries like slash lib, slash user lib. Um, you, you may have also used LD library path to find libraries in other places, but um, as I mentioned, that can break other programs if they use a similar mechanism to find you know, different versions of the same libraries, for example. Um, so in this case, we're um, editing the run paths in the binaries that actually tell the linker where to look for stuff. So that makes the, that means we can install wherever we like after we've compiled in one place. Um, the, it's also regenerating some of the IRF extern.pkg files. We have, each variant has a, an extern.pkg for IRF and based on some of the information in our build scripts, uh, it's generating one of those automatically to um, install IRF. It's, it's regenerating the PYC files for Python, which have uh, paths hard coded in, and um, one or two other things like shell script interpreters, where it starts with uh, comment exclamation mark. It's changing those paths to the right ones so that everything works. So then, when that's finished, we'll be able to run it from our home directory. It takes three and a half minutes, I think. I don't know how long I've been talking, but I, I think I'm doing okay for time, <laughs> if I do say so myself. Um, so we'll just let that finish. I should have timed it actually, then I'd know. Yes, is you, yeah, you can do that. There's no, everything's kind of absolute. There's no, where was it installed last time? Where's it installed now kind of logic. Um, so. Yeah, it's not lightning fast, but well, you, you take I could take a question. Okay. I'm an old fourth programmer. Is fourth still in use anywhere? And if so, is there a use for an inter integrating with it? I don't know if fourth is in use anywhere, really. I know that there are fourth like languages in use. Um, but no, I don't, we don't have a case for integrating with it. OK, well. 
doesn't really kind of sync with the name Eureka, does it? <laughs> I got a minute, Eureka. Yeah, that's true. Actually, I think that's on our, one of our track tickets. Is that the you know we need more user feedback for these handful of scripts that the users actually run, so that they know that things haven't hung. There we go. So uh, if the next thing I have to do is basically I have to source a file called misc. Um, what is it? Misc profile. If I'm using bash, so. What that does, all it does is define a command UR setup. I would put that in my login file, and then I have UR setup available wherever I want to run the UR. You could put the UR setup in your um, login file too, but um, but obviously that increases the risk of conf possible conflicts with other stuff if even just because things are in the path or whatever. So I'll do UR setup, and now my Python's the right one in this local build and then uh, I can, I'm going to need to uh, shrink this window a bit. So I can fire up a DS9 for example and a PyRAF. So we have XM tool as well. Um, you can see here that if you're familiar with IRF, there's a list of IRF packages there that are available. There's a fair number of them that we're just bundling with the system for you so that you don't have to install them. Um, they're mainly things we install ourselves internal use, but we'll take requests um, so you can, you know, display to DS9, um, import PyLab, for example, plot a line. I've been messing with my map plot lab the last couple of days. There we go. It worked. All right. Um, so we also have Stuff like IPython as well. And finally, the, I mentioned there was a diagnostic script that we can run that, um, whoops, I'm still in IPython. <laughs> it runs, it logs information from your, from your environment, runs a, a load of little tests just to make sure things are sane, that you have the dependencies you need on your machine. It doesn't depend on anything that's not usually on a desktop machine, um, but there are 20 or so things like X libraries and so on that, that you basically have to depend on. There was one error there because of a known binary compilation problem in STS test that we're working on. So that's it. I think I'm actually in time. Yeah. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a new front end for IRAF that replaces the CL um, and it allows you to run Python code or IRAF CL code or, or SPP code you can call into as well. Um, so it looks like the CL to a user, but it also allows you to do Python. And initially it had more features as well in terms of being an interactive shell than, than CL did, although it's improved a bit since then. Yes, so th that's also an important thing that you can actually control your um, IRF stuff from Python and even get things like, uh, you know, error handling if you <laughs> should be so inclined. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, this is kind of, you know, we're working with STSCI on this, and it's the same STSCI Python that they distribute, or it will be. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how they'll be synchronized, but... It, Not really. Um, you can use Matplotlib uh, to render the plots from PyRAF, and it will they'll come out nicely anti-aliased like they do in Matplotlib. But it's not the same GUI. It isn't actually Matplotlib really. It still looks like IRAF. So um, it's still using the IRAF graphics kernel. Yeah. Make plots, so yeah. It's not using all the Yeah. 
uh, random places and frustrates me to no end. So I was wondering if there's any testing, you know, to make sure that kind of thing. There's certainly testing. I mean, I, I'm not the person to answer the question. You should talk to Perry and Eric about that. But uh, yeah, okay. talk to them about it afterwards because I'm sure they'll be interested to hear that. <laughs> um, okay, last one because I need to let let's. I don't know what's... No, no, I know it's not using it. I'm just wondering how much of what's been done could be done with the virtual app. It just smells a lot like it. And all the requirements you can just have in a, have in a file and have it go off to the right places to get it. The virtual app really breaks down with the binaries. Okay, so it's specific to uh, IRAC stuff. Like a lot of the problem with this Jake.